we can go ahead and uh, get going. So the theme for this was, you know, 70s throwback, and that was prompted by Sean, who has a Hamilton um, or a Pulsar P2 watch that he had okay. serviced. So can I inter can I no. interrupt Jim? Sure, yeah, go ahead, Rex. Uh, now that you're recording, do you want to? Uh, it'd be nice if you'd reiterate very briefly the the upcoming potential uh, Denver Regional or Rocky Mountain Regional again. Some guys okay. didn't hear. We can do that, and, and actually, be on um, recording. Uh, Terry Jones, do you want to unmute yourself and talk about it? You're the chairman of that, are I believe still? Yes. <clears throat> well. David uh, and I, uh, Dave Fornoff and I just talked last week about it. One of the reasons for going originally, his idea was going with the, um, I guess it's the Boulder County Fairgrounds up in Longmont, was to uh, dovetail with Strawberry Days. Well, that was going to be in April or May and that's been canceled as far as we can tell. So there was no potential for dovetailing with anyone else. Uh, so David, a week and a half ago, sent me a diagram. I've never been to the Boulder Fairgrounds. Uh, and by the way, we did confirm that the Jefferson County Fairgrounds, where we've been for the last five or six years is not allowing groups like ours in there anymore. It's strictly <clears throat> animal related and youth groups like 4-H kids and things like that. So that's no longer available, which I would love to still be able to go there. Uh, so anyway, I looked at this diagram and it's a huge space and they won't even let us go into um, preview the space right now in at the Boulder County Fairgrounds. So I threw out an idea to Dave and I wanted some feedback that maybe we ought to go with our date that we have reserved uh, with the national, the last day of July, first day of August, Friday, uh, Saturday and Sunday. And maybe even do a one day mini mart like Colorado Springs does and do it at the church where our chapter 21 meetings have been all along there on uh, South University Boulevard or there's a church next door to me where I live in Southeast Denver that might be available where our coin club has been meeting and the chance would be to not only have tables inside but have some tables outside in the parking lot or on the lawn and just have a one day mini mart. Um, we may not be able to have that officially sanctioned by the national because I think they require two days for a regional, but we could have a mini mart for one day and that might be a compromise under the circumstances. So I was gonna throw that out for ideas and. Maybe Dan, you have some comment. Uh, Tim, you might have comments, both Tim's. So we're exploring that right now. So that would be a cancellation actually of the Boulder County Fairgrounds event and then just convert it to a one day mini mart? Yes. Okay. Because I was throwing out the possibility of trying to pair up or get other people involved and the suggestion would be the, the camera clubs in Denver the Denver Photo Society and the Colorado Camera Collectors. And I, there might be one other group that you could conceivably uh, pair up with. They are also a small collector's group of generally a lot of older folks and some younger folks. And the, their, their meetings have been getting smaller and smaller over the years as well. Well, I've thought of that, including the there's a coin club that used to meet out at Jefferson County Fairgrounds. And I'm assuming they're in the same dilemma we are, trying to figure out a new space. They're probably looking at alternatives like hotel facilities around the Denver area. And those just get expensive has been my experience in the past. They want you to guarantee a certain amount of 
hotel rooms and eat at their restaurant and uh, you're very um, you're, you're sort of limited and they charge you per table and all that so I could explore that a little bit I know one of the guys with the camera club and one of the guys with the coin club and see if they've found a location and if they've got a date. What about the amateur radio people, Tim? Do you have connections? I don't really have a whole lot of connections with, with those guys, but I can try and reach out and see. I can look at my past emails and to those guys and send a message to a, their address and see what they say. I there's there's a possibility of that too. My thought was if we could have it at a church like where we meet on university and put some big signs out and draw the public there for a one day we might get more activity. Otherwise it's just a bunch of old guys like you and me uh selling and showing to each other. That's and, definitely the case that, uh, you know, we're a lot of us are sharing our, our collections with each other or doing the great cir circular uh, selling thing where everybody sells something or trades something to the right. And uh, eventually you start getting your old stuff back again. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's certainly what's that's certainly what the Colorado Springs thing has. Well, it's a little early, I think five you know at least five years from now when everything is completely back to normal and travel is insane again which is what i'm assuming is going to happen the denver hotel convention center mart venues are not an unreasonable place to go if you're hoping to get people coming in from out of state as well and i think that there is you know, again, a potential demand for that. Unknown if it's enough to make it uh, an affordable thing for what we're used to paying versus what people are used to paying for like the JC, whatever that is, the, you know, some of the more expensive trading organizations that are thousands of dollars a year membership and $500 an event kind of venues and who knows. Well, I'll do a little more uh, exploring with some other groups this week. And uh, Kepke, the guy at the National, called me yesterday and left a voicemail. They want to get us committed to a date uh, if we're going to do an actual NAWCC sanctioned uh, regional because uh, they want to make sure we get our advertising out to the uh, membership. And uh, I haven't called him back yet to tell him we're still a little bit in limbo here. So I'll pull something together and send an email out and you can let people know through your group, Tim and chapter 21 we'll do the same i can if it's okay with you i can tell them what we have tentatively planned for at the boulder county fairgrounds and solicit feedback and um but i would say that it's you know still pretty early in the game for commitments and i suppose with the national if you say yeah we're, or with the national folks if you say yes we're going to do it this day and then you change your mind later it's probably not going to be a big deal i'm guessing do you Correct? like the uh, boulder fairgrounds you've been there and seen the layout yeah, I've been there a lot of times. Uh, Longmont Amateur Radio Club and the Boulder Amateur Radio Club both have had their events there. But Rex, you got your hand up. Yeah, I wanted to just comment to Terry. Uh, <clears throat> I'm unusual in that I'm a, uh, I'm a local guy who's not collecting anymore and who's actually trying to dispose of much of his large collection. And I've still got over 500 wristwatches that I'm trying to get rid of. Uh, I can promise you if, if we have a regional where we have a chance to draw better from the public, uh, I can guarantee four or five tables. Uh, two of them would be watchmakers tools and the rest would be wristwatches. So uh, I know I'm in the minority, but I'm in favor for getting uh, more and more of the public involved in attending. That's it. Well, I am too. And that's been a lot of our plan and discussion and uh, even when we were at Jefferson County Fairgrounds we were lucky even but we would get maybe 50 or 60 public in there over a two-day period and that was about it so if we went to Boulder County Fairground and we were not dovetailing with any other groups it may be the same thing where there's not much public going to show up and we're just 
selling to each other. That was my concern. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult to get the public in. Uh, it's very difficult to get the public in. People, I, I have to say this, people think it's easy. People think all you got to do is put a sign out on the street. And, and it is nowhere near enough. It is a waste of time, in fact, in most cases. You know, to get the public in requires a very, very orchestrated and concerted effort to make everybody aware of the damn show. And, you know, we've seen this over and over again with regionals. They said, well, you know, we put signs out, you know, well, big Broadway deal. <laughs> I mean, there's not enough people are going to see that. You got to have a whole campaign uh, to make everybody aware. And that's takes a lot of work. And in some cases, it takes a fair amount of money. You know, is it, you know, it's like we hear, oh, well, we put an ad in the penny saver. Well, big Broadway deal. You put an ad in the penny saver. You know, who cares? Uh, you got to fish where the fish are. And uh, that's oftentimes more expensive than we'd like it to be. Yeah, think, social media can be a big part of that. Yeah, I think that, you know, there is a strong interest in, in horology. And I think there's a lot of interest in particular wristwatches, vintage wristwatches, tool watches, and military stuff. You know, for example, tonight, uh, the Denver Red Bar group is having a session given by the guy who owns the Cherry Creek Watch Company on, on military wristwatches, uh, Alex Greenberg. You know, there are people out there that are interested, but reaching out to them is the challenge and they're not going to be reading antique uh, newspapers, you know, they're, they're doing things differently. And so, as you say, social media, uh, Reddit, other places might be, you know, where you can try and get some traction. Anyway, um, have we covered uh, enough of that at this point? Uh, is there more to add? This is maybe a, a sidebar, but I was just kind of curious. My wife and I were talking. Are are a lot of you guys vaccinated? Like a lot of you guys had access to to them? Because yeah, because I mean, in my mind, that that changes things, right? That like opens these things up, like on how we're <clears throat> how people are getting together, and there's not there's not nearly as much concern if you guys are all all vaccinated. But I know I'm, you know, it's going to probably be a little while before I get one. But my wife is getting one currently because she's a, a healthcare worker, so. Okay, I think that, uh, you know, certainly by the J July standpoint, I think anybody who wants a vaccine, vaccination shot can get can get it. I mean, they're, they're hoping that, you know, really in another end of May is what they're talking about. So that's eight weeks from now, 10 weeks from now. Yeah. And, you know, yes, a lot of us old farts have gotten our at least our first dose, if not both. Cool. So that, and it definitely makes things more comfortable. Okay. Yeah. I was just kind of curious because we're, we're at that point now where we're talking about things that are a few months out. There's going to be kind of like a big sea change by that few months out. So um, I think it's also going to, the statistics will indicate how things are going. If suddenly, you know, if new cases are like down in the noise level, then I think people will certainly be more comfortable. Right now, with the death rate still at, you know, around 2,000 a day in the United States, I mean, that's more in one day than Korea has lost in this entire episode. So we're not doing so great still as a nation. Yeah. yeah. Governments, uh, governments and uh, venues both have tremendous influence on this, you know, uh, if you uh, were going to have a show in Texas or Mississippi, you know, or Wyoming, uh, it would be no problem. Uh, but uh, not only the government regulations, but also the venues have their own uh, regulations. I noticed that, for example, uh, you know, we're going to be having this national convention in uh, Hampton, Virginia, but most of the museums in the area you know, for uh, related uh, interest, they're closed right now. So, you know, you got to balance what's going on with the government, balance what's going on with the venues, and uh, balance what's going on with the disease itself. I mean, it's... I think it's, 
Yeah, it's interesting too, because there's gonna, there's going this summer, late spring and this summer, it's going to be not only like a physical transitioning period, it's it's going to have to be a mental transitioning period as well. So, I mean, part of me thinks that if, yeah, if you time this right, this could be this really fun event that everybody can go out and enjoy and, and it can be done responsibly. Um, but it's, who knows, it's so hard to tell. It really all depends on everybody's uh, risk tolerance. <laughs> and obviously there's a number of people that feel that <clears throat> masks are currently unnecessary or not for them. But I yeah. think, you know, hopefully by a few months out, it'll be less relevant as to other people's behavior. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, Jack and I went to the one down in Colorado Springs last year, and that was maybe like the last weekend before everything closed down. And we had no idea what was coming. You know, it's like, we went down there and went, Oh, this is fun. This is great. Little did we know it'd be the last time that we, <laughs> that we saw people in a large group mm -hmm. at all for, for a year, you know, so yeah. it'd be fun to see everyone again. Yeah. Well, on that note, I have enabled screen sharing for everybody, and I can either solicit uh, people who want to start talking about what they have, or I can sort of show off some stuff or talk about the 70s a little bit. Uh, how do you, how would you guys like to proceed? Well, I wasn't around in the 70s yet, so uh, maybe I'll let somebody else start <laughs> and, then I, and then I can show my stuff. Somebody who was around in the 70s, huh? Well, let me uh, go ahead and bring up a couple things here. <clears throat> okay, so having a little bit of a challenge here trying to find things. Um, first of all, a couple websites to bring up. This crazywatches.pl has um, a lot of really fascinating stuff available, and they have them categorized by different types as you can see across the top here and i had a few things brought up the hp01 calculator watch from 77 which was of interest to me i was working for hewlett packard at the time as an intern in the loveland division there they had a small group called the calculator products division they were working on their third generation of machines at the time and i was a intern attempting to write uh, the user's manual for uh, the call at the 98035 real-time clock peripheral for the 9825 desktop calculator. The desktop calculators of the day did not have real-time clocks built into them. And this calculator was being used to control instrumentation. So there are times when you wanted to know what the time was when you were doing data acquisition, for example. Then here are the uh, crazy watches. This is the uh, the Pulsar P2, which uh, Sean has one of. And a great article on Hodinkee is this Four Revolutions series that was written about three years ago, maybe four years ago. And they were talking about basically the 70s through now. And um, the quartz watch arrival in the 70s really changed the whole watch industry, obviously, oh, quite a bit. But they have a good thing here on the LED watch. And uh, the, the most amusing part of it is John Berge was a 36-year-old head of R&D at Hamilton Watch Company in 1970 when the first pulsars were announced. Hamilton announced the pulsars in the 70, in, in the 70 uh, because they were concerned about uh, the Japanese and the Swiss coming out with quartz products. And Hamilton didn't really have anything, an answer to that. The Japanese uh, had, re Seiko had released the Astralon about six months prior to this. So Hamilton created three or four prototypes of, of the Pulsar watch. And these were handmade, lots of small discrete components, I think, packed on a bunch of ceramic circuit cards and they were housed in a gold case and they actually had a big slab of synthetic ruby or yeah ru sapphire synthetic sapphire ruby colored sapphire that was the display window and they announced it in may even uh, 70 even though they knew that they couldn't deliver it and they were optimistic saying it'd be a year later and so on the announcement it was done in new york city at the four seasons and um, John Berge went to appear on 
The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and uh, The Tonight Show did, um, you know, occasional product announcements and stuff. And so showed Johnny Carson this watch, and uh, as I say, the watch was too weird for uh, for Johnny Carson, and he he uh, declared that this will never put Mickey Mouse out of business and tossed this watch over his shoulder, you know, behind him. I assume it landed on something soft because it probably wouldn't have survived if it landed on concrete. And Johnny Carson also said uh, with this watch, you'll know the exact time you go bankrupt when it was 15 announces going to be like $1,500. So it uh, was kind of a, an, an amusing start to it all. But the, the Pulsar was a really big hit. And when they finally did start selling them, here's the Astralon, or the Astron, Astron, yeah, not Astralon. They started shipping these in 1972, and they were about $1,300 in gold, and that's about 13000 in today's dollars or something. But it was, it was a really big hit, and it took off like crazy. It, it was such a successful product for... Hamilton, they couldn't keep up with it. And Hamilton reorganized the company into their electronics group and their watch group. And they sold the mechanical side of the business to, at that time was SSIH, which became the Swatch group in the end. And so the Swatch group still owns the Hamilton name. It's one of their their, um, 19 uh, brand companies. But the LED watches for about a three-year period were really hot, and they thought incorrectly, many people, that this was going to bring watchmaking back to the U.S., and they even announced that, you know, like Business Week was saying, you know, the resurrection of the watch market in the United States, and all kinds of people bought these things, you know, Emperor of Ethiopia, King of Jordan, Shah of Iran, all kinds of people had these these watches, and people just really wanted LEDs. That was the big demand. Even Seiko was getting demand for LEDs, and Patek Philippe were getting demand for LEDs, but they weren't going to do it, and in the, by 1977, there was a glut of watches on the market and there were up to words of 77 US companies making digital watches at that time because there was very little barrier to entry if you could get the raw components. Uh, this particular article shows, um, this is a great picture, a clock that Hamilton had designed for a 2001 Space mm-hmm. Oddity. If you notice uh, the display on it though, those are what we call Nixie tubes which are a neon gas discharge technology uh, that was prevalent at the time. The pulsar name came from pulsating stars or were known as pulsars and and Berge came up with the name when he read an an, an astronomy journal article on them. So yeah, April of 72 is when they were um, released and um, it sold for, okay, they, they've got 2100 which is $150 more than a gold Rolex. Pulsar uh, had 400 watches available at launch, and they sold them through upscale retailers like Tiffany's and Emus Marcus, and they sold out in three days. So they were popular. This story of the person who bought the last Pulsar at Tiffany's before Christmas of 72 had two offers for it on his way out of the store. Sort of like game consoles these days. But um, as I said, the market became flooded with low cost stuff. And 75 was kind of the peak of it. Uh, 77, we'd sort of gone over the top. And what was going on in, the, in by the 77 was that people like uh, Texas Instruments got in and they started bombing the price. And so Texas Instruments, they came out with a first model that was about a hundred dollar in in a Swiss metal case. But then a, less than a year later, they announced the plastic version for 1995. And a year later, or less than a year later, they dropped that price to 995. So at that point, the watches were 
going from being an expensive thing that you bought at Tiffany's to something that was for sale in blister packs at drugstores and, and other kinds of mass merchandising outlets. And people were starting to, they got over the, the uniqueness of the LED display. You know, having to have two hands to check the time or flicking your wrist and then, well, it still took two hands if you're outside because you could flick your wrist, but then you had to shield your hand, you know, the the watch from sunshine so you could see the, what the red leads were saying so um basically the market collapsed after 1977 and uh went bust in probably 1978 and at that point yeah. hamilton hamilton was losing money yeah, and, leave. and uh okay. they actually um sold the pulsar name after after losing a bunch of money and uh, even texas instruments gave up in 1981 and laid off uh 2800 people in their watch division and surprisingly the only survivor of this i mean the digital watch market from the u.s standpoint was the timex <laughs> so and obviously they're still the ones that are big big survivor but of course now apple is back in but that's a whole different technology so what else okay. here a oh, wired article on the uh, on, on the, uh, they, they, they called it um, a, a, the, a computer on the wrist or a time computer, Pulsar time computer. And we have uh, some LED watch history here. Let me uh, stop rambling here. I'll stop my screen share and uh, let other people jump in. Tim? Okay, I'm unmuted now. Um, I found this uh on it's an ebay seller who is actually just selling the photograph is all and i i trust everybody can see that this is a gerard perigo digital watch and you you can't see it right well what we're what we're seeing is your desktop but uh oh, we're not wait a minute try again it's there Okay, now let's try this. Now we got it, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is Gerard Perigo, and the premise that they operated on was they said, okay, these LED watches are really, really hard to read in bright light, outdoors in the sun and stuff like that. So they deliberately built a sort of shadow box for their display, and you actually, uh, the guy is wearing the watch incorrectly, of course, but you actually wore the watch or looked at the watch from the side rather than from the top. The top was just plain. You still had to press a button, but that was just because of the uh, high power consumption of the uh, LEDs. So I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. And that is a very futuristic looking design. And they were using a standard module that uh, Bulova also used on some of their watches and I'll show one uh, here in a bit. Yeah, that's great. That, that a lot of that stuff was is a good a good preface into sort of like what I was going to show. I've got a couple of those things actually that I was going to pull up, but the um I'll go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> so, I became <clears throat> I remember uh, first things when I was a kid and in the James Bond movie, Live and Let Die, it was the first Roger Moore Bond movie. And at the beginning of the movie, he wears the this Pulsar watch. And then it, it has this close up where he, um, you know, he it looks down on the wrist and he clicks it and the LEDs come on and then it clicks off. And so I've always remembered this from when I was a kid. And I th <clears throat> always thought it was something that I wanted to, uh, to eventually track down. I like you know, James Bond is kind of one of my other hobbies and I collect, you know, the books and, and uh, other things when I can. There are plenty of James Bond watches and I don't know, I don't like actively pursue a lot of James Bond watches, but this was just one of those ones that always kind of stuck in my head. And so last year, like right after the, uh, the lockdown started, the Hamilton announced that they were going to start remaking essentially like the the p2 and um they're calling it the psr and um i went through and i thought oh that's great like i've always wanted one of those and they're accessible so why don't i go ahead and just get one of these and then i started doing all the research into them to actually figure out what was going on and i thought well i actually probably would rather have the pulsar the actual p2 one that, that roger moore had so and I thought, well, I better get one of these now before they get too crazy, knowing that 
Hamilton's re-releasing these things. And I think they're what, seven or 800 bucks a piece, you know, for the, for the re-edition. And, um, and I thought, yeah, I better, I better track one of these down quickly before they just, they get unreasonable. So I found a guy on eBay in LA that had one. It didn't work and he wasn't prepared to open it and see what was going on in there and stuff. So he just said, Hey, you know, I, I, I've got it. I just found it in a box of stuff. It doesn't work. Offer me what you want to offer me. So I think I paid 150 bucks for it. And I thought, oh, that's a pretty like decent, you know, uh, entry. The case was in good shape. The band is in good shape. <clears throat> and there's a photo of it. And, uh, and I thought if nothing else, you can probably get these things. You can get another module or you can get them repaired. Um, there's gotta be some, some way around this. And if nothing else, the, the crystal, the case, everything was in good shape. So, um, so I got it. I opened it up myself. Of course, it the module ended up looking kind of like this. <laughs> where does Bert? Does Bert want to say something? I, <clears throat> I've gotten enjoyed it very much. Those are some very erudite uh, discussion, Tim, that you put on and uh, found and gathered together. <clears throat> but I'm, I'm, I'm tired now, and so I'm going to quit. Sounds good, Bert. You've been on for over an hour, so it's good to see you, and we'll see you next time. All right, good. Good to see you, Bert. So, so I opened it up, and it was all corroded, you know, and it just looked, it looked like hell. Uh, that well, there's no fixing this. So, I um, oh, I was going to show this too. Book of Bond thing. It's, <laughs> It's, it's huge. And I got it for Christmas a few years ago. It's great. Cause it's got all these, like, um, it's got all these behind the scene photos and, um, uh, set design and, and stuff like that. It's really like, it's ah, as an architect, it's pretty cool. Cause it's got the, the set designers, original sketches for like, um, you know, villain layers and, and things like that. And, and, uh, model photos and like they've got schematics of like the rocket packs and and stuff like that i just had the drawings of like the gadgets and the cars and stuff like that it's almost like too hard to hold up actually but it's this big coffee table book that i keep in the bar little bar area and it's got drawings and uh you know behind the scenes photos and stuff like that and <clears throat> one of the ones the photo in here that I bookmarked was it's from, it's just a still shot from Live and Let Die where uh, Roger Moore is actually wearing the P2 and then he's using the magnet in the Submariner to unzip the the woman's dress down the back. So he's got both, both watches in his hand um, at the same time. And so that was one of those other things. I've got one of my Bond things and I always thought I'm going to get one of these P2s. So I open it up, the module's all is all corroded. And then I looked on eBay for a couple of weeks to just see if I could just buy either a scrapped P2 uh, uh, watch that was just really rough, you know, that I could take the module out of, or if somebody was was um, actually just selling the modules themselves. It didn't really yield um, any good results um, for a while. So what I did was I found this guy over in England and he's on a pulsarledtime.com. And he is, he's a retired engineer of some kind. And what he did was he designed this little board that is meant to be a replacement for the original P2 boards. And what he does is he takes out your module, he um, un, unsolders the LED um, screen, the LED module itself, and then resolders it along with that. And then the switches onto um, the board. So you've got a couple of things on here. You've got the LEDs and then you've got like the switch buttons, depending on whether you have the P2 or the P3, it's just the one button. And this little you know, trapezoidal or, you know, sort of home base shaped piece right here can be removed from this larger carrier and replaced with this PLT one that he's designed. So he designed it, he had a bunch of them made and for, it's almost, it's almost insane. It's like a hundred dollars. He'll do this for a hundred dollars, which is, you know, you got to ship it over to London, but it's really not that bad. So 
I talked back and forth with him and I sent him some photos of my module and he said, yeah, that's probably toast, but I can probably use the LEDs and the, the, uh, the switch contacts. I'll put one of these PLTs in there. It'll cost you maybe 150 bucks round trip. Shouldn't be that bad. Um, so I sent it over to him and as soon as they got there, cause I'd waited until maybe like June or July. And he said, oh yeah, I'm backed up. I've had 15 people send me these things in the last uh, two months. So the pandemic had kind of kicked a lot of people's butt into gear like mine. And he said the waiting, you know, I'll, I'll get to it as soon as I can. And I think around Thanksgiving, he finally got to mine and he said, you know, I pulled yours apart and it's so corroded that the, the sealed LED modules and stuff are actually bad. So I can do one of two things. He had another thing made that's not on here um, that's a full replacement for the module and it uses a different type of LEDs and stuff like that. Or he said, I've got a number of contacts down in Brazil. So there used to be like a, a Pulsar factory down in Brazil. And so if you're looking for parts, original parts, there's a, a cache of them down in Brazil. So I said, hey, I prefer to have the original LEDs kind of grafted onto this thing. So let me know if you can, you can find that. So a couple of weeks later, he, he emailed me back and said, yep, I've got, um, I found a new LED module and a switch plate and stuff. So, so for an extra $100, he got a source to the parts, $100 for this. And then it was like five bucks for the battery and then the battery spacers that, uh, that you need uh, to fit the modern batteries in there. And then, um, and then he puts it all back together and shipped it back to me. And I got it, <clears throat> what, about, uh, about a month ago now. And it's really, <laughs> it's, it's just like the, the best bang for my buck that I've gotten out of a watch in a long time. Like it just makes me smile when I turn it on. It's really kind of funny. And it's cool. It has the original band on it is a, is a JB Champion uh, band. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty comfortable. It's very similar to my Speedmaster uh, band. It's almost like the, the, 11, the 1131. It's almost like identical. It's, the watch itself is very lightweight. The case back, it has this screw ring that then clamps down the case itself that um, has like a little, uh, a little notch in it. And then to set it, there's a little, there's a watch setting tool hidden in the clasp. And so this thing flips up. You get your fingernail under there and then it flips up. Oh, I must have oh, I erased the wrong photo. <clears throat> um, it's a magnet that uh, there's two read switches in the in the uh, in the watch inside the watch. So you, you're holding the magnet uh, near those read switches to activate mm -hmm. one or the other. Yeah, it looks like a, a Wiley Coyote Acme magnet kind of horseshoe shape sort of thing. And, uh, and you just, yeah, you pull it out of the clasp and you just hold it to either the hour or the minute area. And then it just, it just advances, you know, as slowly. And, uh, and so that's how you set it. And it, um, when you push the, when you push the, you know, there's the, the one button. So the later models had another button on the side there and you push it and the, the, the LEDs come on and you get this, I think the crystal creates a lot of this, this kind of like deep red glow, but you can see how small the LEDs are and it comes on for maybe three seconds and then it, and then it shuts off. And then if you hold the button, then it switches over to a counting seconds. So then you get these, these two become a, a counting seconds that you can actually see tick over and stuff. So it's really, it's, it's kind of pretty and it's kind of fun. It's lightweight and uh, it's very vintage and it just calls me, you know, it just reminds me of that initial shot with Roger Moore doing this at the be you know, the opening scene of Live and Let Die. So the kind of like the article you had, Tim, the, you know, Revolution has a really good article and it shows, you know, kind of the progression. It's like, and all the people who had them, right? You got Keith Richards and there's the Roger Moore, Gianni Agnelli, you got Joe Frazier, you know, Gerald Ford, Elton John. Like at the time they were just like so uh, entrenched as this new thing in, in pop culture. So that was my whole experience with doing it. Yeah, the magnet sits right in here. So the little thing flips up on the clasp and then the magnet sits in there. And for not that, you know, not that much money, I, this one required a lot of patience. That's what, you know, it was dealing with the, the guy in, in, in London. He was very nice. And, um, and as far as I'm concerned, is you know, like a kind of a boutique craftsman uh, like this time frame wasn't really that bad. 
um, but it required some patience. And but I think what I got out of it was a, a fun, a very fun watch that is is kind of easy easy to wear and uh, and is very emblematic of the of what I believe the 1970s to be since I wasn't around. But it's cool. That was that was my experience. I think that. Uh... You know, it's a good choice. It's nice that you got one of the original ones. I've had a couple in the past, but I wasn't so much into collecting them at the time. I picked them up at a ham radio swap and I sold them on eBay uh, back back in in the late 90s. And I kind of wish I had it now, but such mm-hmm. is life. Mm-hmm. The, I assume that yours suffered its fate because batteries leaked in it over and stayed in it for a long period of time and basically it, it was corroded by electrolyte yeah it, it had a lot of that that battery corrosion kind of green and white kind of chalk all over yep. everything when you encounter those in in digital watches or any piece of electronics when when the damn batteries leak i use vinegar to uh, neutralize it because it tends to be a base So you can put vinegar in and it'll actually remove that white stuff really well. The crazywatches.pl guy, he shows many uh, examples of opening up and doing repairs on all kinds of uh, electromechanical and electronic watches and mechanical only watches. And he uses uh, vinegar and alcohol as a mixture for cleaning circuit boards. The real problem with these early electronic module watches is that they tended to do what we call chip on board they would get the raw semiconductor chip put it right on the circuit board which in the early days were ceramic and then later was just glass epoxy fiberglass based boards and then they had people working wire bonders that would connect the wires from the chip to the circuit board and then they'd put a blob of epoxy over it some some sort of sealant, maybe silicon uh, kind of sealer, but it's not really a fully hermetically sealed enclosure. And so moisture and other things can travel, you know, through the surface of the circuit board, even though it, it seems like it's an impenetrable thing. It, it can soak up fluids and you can transfer moisture into the assembly and then that starts attacking the module. The early modules were also sensitive to static. They didn't really understand just how prevalent and how high a voltage you could generate by just waving your hand in the air or rubbing your shirt. And so they didn't have protective diodes um, or varistors or surge suppressors on transient absorbers on, on the chips at the time. So you're changing a battery and you do something wrong and you know, you get a discharge from your screwdriver, your tweezers, and suddenly your watch doesn't work anymore. But most of them, I think, were people were trying to be economical at the time, and they were buying lower cost alkaline batteries rather than higher quality mercury or silver oxide batteries. And those tended to leak uh, more readily than others. Yeah. I knew as soon as I got it, it was like, (laughs) it was like, buying a lottery ticket kind of it was like all right is this thing going to be toast or is this thing going to be viable and then yeah as soon as you open it up and you you see the that um that kind of that efflorescence you know from the 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 alkali kind of residue in there it's like this thing is somebody let the battery just just explode in here so yeah and it's one of those things too i don't i don't usually i don't buy that many watches that i can't kind of work on myself or somehow and this was one of those ones where I thought, whatever, I'm not going to be able to do anything to this and um, other than clean it up and get it ready for somebody else to actually kind of fix. So it's, um, it was kind of, I kind of went out on a limb there, but ultimately it didn't cost that much money. And it's, um, it's a, it's a cool, it's a novel thing. I feel like, especially with Hamilton now coming back out with the, the re-edition of that, it sort of means that it's been long enough now that, that it's, it's looped back around and it's novel again to, to where, LEDs are so ubiquitous in everything else in our lives, but somehow just like a simple version of them in a wristwatch is now novel again. So definitely so. The uh, they had to call it the PSR because they don't own the Pulsar name that is owned by Seiko. 
Seiko, the name was sold when when Hamilton, when the remaining Hamilton company went bankrupt and sold the name to a jewelry merchandiser who then a year later sold it to Seiko and then Seiko used it to brand their lower cost analog quartz watches. So that's that's the Pulsar story. If I may interject here, I've got some things to show you guys. So I didn't know if we were uh, going to have time to maybe do. Well, oh, go do. ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead next, Lucas. Okay, thank you. I've got a few examples here of kind of late 70s, early 80s watches. And of course, I love mechanical watches. So I've got a couple lower cost mechanical watches from the 70s, late 70s. This is a 78. Uh, this is a, um, a 70s. Timex, uh, I don't remember the exact number for it. There it goes. But it's, uh, yeah, it's a cool little watch. Automatic, day date. I got it on eBay and replaced, I think, the third wheel on it that was broken. Um, and I've also got this watch, which I don't, I think you guys might have seen a long time ago. Uh, but this is a Hormelton? Cormelton? I think it's supposed to look like it says Hamilton. It's the Hormelton Electra. And they're trying to make it look like the Hamilton Electric. <laughs> And of course, it's got um, rhinestones uh, between the minute markers. Uh, the funniest thing is there is three rhinestones between each hour index because uh, I guess they couldn't afford to put four. <laughs> but um, it's a fun little 70s watch. In a bit of a, a quality jump here, I have this 24-hour Rakita, this is known as, I think, the Antarctic, and it's got a very cool rotating GMT sub bezel. It's a 24 hour watch, and I think this is from 82. There's no real number that can tell you 100% in those movements, but they're, they're very well made movements for being Soviet from, you know, the 80s when the Soviet Union was on its way down. Stepping up in quality a little bit more classic late 70s designed Waltham automatic day date you'd see that a lot in 70s there we go mechanical watches 17 jewels you know everything's pretty standard there's this very beautiful little Lova whoops Lova this is from I think about 76 77 and thinking about it now I should have brought down my Omax Spaceman but I think I've um, kind of shown that watch off here before uh, but I love the the uh, kind of brush copper face on this below, a very cool example of a, a 70s women's watch, I guess. Final step up in quality. Once again, automatic day date watches. All of these are between 17 and 25 joules. A uh, couple Zodiacs. Uh, they have, you know, Zodiac movement in them, which is pretty heavily based on an ETA. And then I've got my weird Sevilla Titus, which has got, I think, like a. Um, a Salada in it. Cool little four o'clock crown. From what I understand, uh, that that particular dive watch, so Villa Titus bought some of the tooling from Seiko, and this has uh, a Mandarin calendar. And the thing about the Villa Titus is it was Japanese tooled. Uh, the case is made in France. It's got a Swiss movement. It was made for a Chinese market, but by the time the quartz crisis hit, they ended up selling it in Mexico, and then they sold it to Martin, who sold it to me. Uh, I bought this from his booth at the Brass Armadillo back in like 2019, 2018, 2019. So it's uh, definitely the, lar the most well-traveled watch I own. <laughs> Finally, I have some weird little movements here. I have a pretty well-destroyed Pulsar P2, which I got in a um, uh, box of watch parts. And I've been kind of doing a bit of an autopsy on it and seeing just, you know, what kind of chips they were using. It's really cool because it's extremely dated, but everything in here is just so simple. Uh, you can really see, I've been getting more into kind of working with electronics and stuff. You can really see where a lot of the uh, designs for modern electronics came from. And um, I have a couple better examples of the movement. They've got the little LED screens on them. So if anybody's, uh, I'm not using them for anything. So if anybody's looking for, you know, LED screens, and one of them is signed Hamilton, one of them is signed Pulsar. And I think those are good property, actually. Those are, um, 
the the guy in London there, he doesn't have you need the carrier, you need the LED and you need the switch modules and he doesn't carry extra parts. So those are actually for somebody like me who's trying to, you know, who wants to redo one that got corroded and stuff. Those are actually kind of rare. So okay. Yeah. Yeah, I have three of them sitting around that I'm not using. So <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, hang on to them. You might wind up needing them for a future project and volumetrically they're very efficient so the yeah. thing one comment on the mechanical watches during the 70s they were still prevalent in places like mexico because people didn't couldn't afford batteries yeah yeah and i um i know that timex yeah that, that's a good point and i know that a lot of the really classic mechanical watches that i love the weird things oops that a lot of people consider to be ludicrously ugly which i think they're ugly but in the best way possible <laughs> um a lot of those watches i have bought from mexico like my um my continental uh the continental x 1911a it's like a chronograph it's based on the little sears chronograph movement and it's like an eb 8825 and or maybe an eb 8835 and it has you know an acrylic case with fiberglass reinforcement it's got an aluminium face it's got you know orange powder dot or powder painted hands it's a really cool watch and i bought it for 180 bucks from mexico and i have only seen two other watches uh none of which are exactly like it right here i have an example of let me get in my tweezers here a 70s i guess the uh and i have a, a drawer full of these but these are timex electronic movements and most of you probably do know how they work but in case you don't i'm going to show you the balance wheel here as you can see it's got great big copper coil on it and there is an electromagnet in the actual movement and probably won't be able to see it with this camera but there's a little cam on top of this balance wheel and as that balance wheel flicks back and forth it lifts up that cam it disconnects the electromagnet lets that coil move back into a uh, neutral position but once it does the cam moves the electrode closes activates the electromagnet pulls that um, coil right back in place it's regulated by a battery which goes right there uh, and you can still buy the batteries at target um i think it was these watches that made the batteries popular and once you get a battery in them they keep they run for like maybe a month or a month or so before they eventually run out of charge it's it was really more of a gimmick than anything else but they're a really a cool example of how people were figuring out ways to make cheap electronic watches back in the kind of late mid to late 70s people wanted quartz that, that was that that actually predated um the, the quartz revolution those were 60s and those are really electric watches some of them were called electronic if they put a diode in them to stop uh, arc suppression across the switches later on they would put a transistor in there to actually do the high current switching and so those are really more what you'd call electronic balance wheels but those those were the first transition to electric horology yeah and they're you know they're really cool movements i have you know a drawer full i've put together i've got a cool one with a blue dial that i i like but whenever i put a battery in it first of all i don't really like wearing electronic watches i prefer something that's like fully mechanical uh, kind of one of my pet peeves i guess and i also i put a I put a battery in it and it lasts for about a month. So <laughs> I tend not to bother uh, yeah. spending my money. Yeah, Tim, speaking of the, that transition, I used to have a, I wish I still had it, a clock that had an electric motor that wound a mainspring in a mechanical clock. Does anyone have one of those? Yeah, those I've, 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 I've got a number of those. Um, yeah. walked. Those were pretty standard and several different variations. Yeah, I really liked it. I don't know why I got rid of that. I probably now I want to get it back again. So the big problem I have with those, and I've tried to use a few of them by the, the, on the nightstand, 
you hear them whine. Yeah, they, so you you'll be whine. sleeping, yeah. and then all of a sudden you hear this. Yeah. And yeah. you know, with mine, they need service, so there's usually a little squeak that goes accompanies the winding. Yeah. But yeah, they're fun. But they're... I'm gonna run up and go grab my my spaceman and my continental. Be okay. Right well, we'll let somebody else uh, go for a while. Who wants to go next? Dan, you got some '70s stuff. I'm sure you do. I mean, all of your Hi. Omega professionals are. Yeah. 70. Well, I mean, you know, I have a lot of watches from the 70s but they're mostly not very distinctively from the 70s you know what i mean okay the, so i mean i have a, a few things i can share i don't know if it's going to be certainly not as interesting as some of these things that that we've been seeing that are like really 70s <laughs> so what i did is i pulled out some of my watches they're they're from the early 70s that have sort of fairly distinctive case styles of the 70s like these cushion cases that were very you know prevalent in the 70s. So here are a couple. I think Sean has one of these Hoyer Octavia Viceroy. Is that right? So yeah. Yeah. Although I think mine might not be the actual Viceroy one. I think okay. Mine... Yeah. So that's actually kind of an interesting side story. The mm -hmm. so and then this this Seiko is actually like very early 70s from 1970, but I just thought it's interesting to see sort of this case style. You know, the, I guess there was like a it became very popular. And I don't know the design that that caused interest in this but you know maybe a bit of a space age look with a single you know like a single piece case with the curves without extra lugs but sort of a a single piece and so there's a dive watch and sort of a dive style chronograph that have similar case i did you know there's so for those who don't know there is sort of an interesting story behind these viceroys so hoyer was make was making um these hoyer octavia line of of uh uh chronographs and then they did a promotion with a cigarette company called viceroy and um so i don't know if you can see and so it was with this race car driver i'm not even sure who it is and this is from the early 70s and so he was smoking a viceroy <laughs> cigarette and promoting it. And if you can see at the bottom, it says this $200 chronograph, yours for only $88. And so it was like one of those things where you send in a certain number of cigarette packs and $88 and they send you the watch. I'm pretty sure that was it. And, and, and uh, I mean, <laughs> just, just kind of interesting, not the kind of thing you would see today for sure. It was Is that one of the is that one of the actual ads or is that, or did you print that off? I, I printed it out. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I printed, I found it online and printed it out. It, you would think it, it would say how many you have to, oh, one Viceroy carton and $88. <laughs> yeah. So that's great. So that was, I thought that was kind of, at least it kind of takes you back a little, you know, cause that's not something you would see today. For sure, I think that's kind of interesting. Well, and it's it's essentially a professional athlete is advertising for a, <laughs> yeah. a, a cigarette yeah. company. That's right. Yeah, that's not something you'd see. <laughs> and then I noticed as I was looking through my my old dive watches that there was another sort of interesting design that was that became popular in the early '70s, which is this this asymmetric case with integrated crown guard type type style which i really like actually and they're actually very nice to wear and they just seem i don't know there's just something kind of cool about it and here are three watches that their heritage really couldn't be more different but if you you know if you kind of get a look at the style of these cases you see sorry there's a lot of glare but quite a lot of similarity like you see the way they're they're asymmetric so the case is totally asymmetric and protrudes out on the crown side on the three o'clock side and they cut a notch out of that to protect the crown it's all integrated it's kind of like taking everything to the next level of making it just a single piece and these all have a little bit of interest to them so this is a issued i think i've shown this during our military meeting but this is an an issued u.s navy dive watch um made by uh, ben roos and um and so that was that one and then this one 
it's quite a rare watch. When I bought it, I just kind of liked it. And I liked, it. and then I realized that they came in like gray and black and other colors. And I like it so much that I've been wanting to get one another color. And like five years have gone by, I still haven't seen another decent one. I mean, I, I've read now that they only made like a thousand of them or something like that. So these are actually quite rare. And um, to release the crown, uh, the stem on this one, there's a screw on the back. So that's not something you see every day. And if you, if you look online, there's like all kinds of stupid internet stories that say that that screw on the back is a helium release valve, <laughs> but which people may know saturation divers who, who stay um, in pressure chambers for weeks at a time as they're working on oil rigs, they just live at pressure. And so helium kind of creeps past the seals in dive watches for saturation divers. And so when they come to the surface, the the helium can kind of explode the crystal out. And so some watches do have helium release valves, but this is not, it, that's how you release the stem. So with that one, you would take that screw completely out and then try and find the little uh, screw in on the movement or does that screw actually connect now You just back to the it movement? off. You just back it off and pull the stem and then, then, then the movement comes out from the top. Okay, that's really, kind of having the screw penetrate the case sort of removes some of the, you know, compromises of waterproofing potentially. But you know, it's a challenge. Did you notice what the pressure rating yeah, is? Yeah, a thousand meters. A <laughs> thousand meters. Yeah. It kind of reminds me. Yeah, I have a few thousand meter rated watches and you would think so, but yeah, this was actually, it's not in the, the dial is a little moldy, but I, I love this watch and I would love to get a gray one. It reminds me of it. Sorry, it reminds me of this one acrylic cased watch I saw that was also very seventies, and it just had a hole in the back of the acrylic case <laughs> for you to take the screw. No plug, no little cap, just a hole. <laughs> and of course, That's the funny. yeah. And I saw a couple uh, kind of iteration. One one of them was in the metal case. The nicer one was acrylic, but the metal case one, the hole was completely filled up with gunk. <laughs> So. And then the last one, just quickly, um, is just sort of a, a an obscure branded uh, French watch called a uh, Herma. But what's interesting about it is for people who are familiar with vintage dive watches, this is its case. It's in a case by a company that was that's called Squale, which is an Italian company. Squale means shark, I believe, in Italian. And I I have a couple of Squale watches that actually say Squale on the dial. It'll always be double branded, almost. They're, they're also a modern company that, that, that brand their watches Squally, but in the 70s, they would be branded some other brand, like some obscure name like Blandford or Eagle Star or something like that. But then they would say Squally at the bottom and they had different cases for 25 meter, 50 meter, 100 meter cases. And the, they're interesting cases too, but I just pulled this one. This is basically equivalent to the Squally 25 meter case, but it's not marked Squally anywhere, but it is um, unquestionably a Squally case. And it was just assembled by this French company that just put together this actually very nice little dive watch, um, clearly in the seventies. And it just goes to show how prevalent that general style of case was, even though they're all a little bit different there was you know just something very 70s early 70s about that that way of making a case so anyway that was the best i could do i don't really have any of the quartz crisis things to things to show yeah no problem great thanks for sharing it did it's squally made the the cases for like the 50 fathoms watches right like the the blanc pond and then the the ones that were branded waltham yeah i think so yeah that's like a whole different series that was earlier mm -hmm. but I think you could be right about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah and nice. you're right. There are a few brands that use those same cases. Nice. Yeah, those are really Yeah, the other the the higher depth rating Squally cases have um, the crown at four. They're they're also integrated. I should have pulled that one out. I have one too. They they have a also integrated crown guard, but it's very it's asymmetrical down at four. Not everybody likes it. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> um 
if you don't mind, I would like to show off uh, the last kind of couple things I have here from the uh, 70s, some 70s obscurity. You remember I was talking about acrylic cases and those kind of things. I have a weird example. It's a sports chronograph made by Continental. I think this is 70, uh, 76, 77. And this is known as a flyback posograph. It is a functional chronograph, as you can see, start, stop, reset, and the buttons are reversed because it's a little EV <laughs> uh, movement in there. But the cool thing, one of the cool features this watch has is you can start it and you can pause it and it also can fly back. It's, it, it doesn't even have a cam lever movement in it, <laughs> but it's, um, it, it's a cool little, uh, it's a cool little very 70s watch. One of my favorite features is when you set the hands, are those going forward? Yeah, when you set the hands backwards, it will actually grab the calendar and it will set the calendar just by moving the hands backwards. It's a, actually a very convenient little feature because normally watches of this kind of era would not have a quick set function. So it's surprisingly convenient because I'm used to um, overshooting my calendar by a day and then spending about five minutes spinning my crown back and forth <laughs> um, about 31 times. Kind of my last 70s timepiece here, very 70s. The Omax Spaceman. Um, this is the Odisseau version. I believe I, I pr probably pronounced that wrong. Uh, I bought this from India. It said they thought it would take a month to get here. It ended up taking about three days. <laughs> Uh, so I was very lucky on that. And Omax made uh, the space, the, the original Omax Spaceman. They made a few iterations. There was like a quartz iteration. If you look it up, there's all sorts of cool pictures you can find. Uh, but the original Spaceman was based, it was made in 1969. It was based on the space helmet that the astronauts on the moon mission wore. And the Odyssey had this crazy square case. This is supposed to be all black here, but this watch has been so well loved that it has a, actually a very pretty fade. This is the original bracelet. I, th I think it's in house, although I'm not sure. It is 100% stainless steel. Um, and there is one peg that keeps trying to leave the bracelet. I, and I've been silly adjusting that to not, uh, to not fall apart on me. This watch doesn't have the original crown. The traditional crowns were kind of weird. They had like a, uh, they had a, a line cut in them where you could uh, pull them out and you need to replace the crystal on because that's broken. But Omax made these watches for kind of the Saudi Arabian uh, market and the Middle East market. And they, they, it is a Swiss made watch. In fact, it's got a tritium rating of more than 25. So um, same thing you might see on like a Samariner or something like that. And uh, only Omax would have the orange hands and the orange calendar was kind of their gimmick. I believe a lot of Omax Spaceman enthusiasts called this particular, what, maroon dial with the white hands and red seconds hand and calendar the Omax Mars because it's very rusty. I know they had one that they called the Galaxy, which was like uh, black and white and then they had a white dial one with some black highlights and I think that one is called like the stratosphere but I really like this watch it's got some uh, imperfections uh, there's this gasket a square gasket which holds the dial in place and there's four screws on the case back here and from what I understand you have to take these four screws out and wedge out the entire bottom of the case, not just the case back. This is independent. You have to wedge out the entire bottom of the case to actually clean up the dial. And I would have serviced it since then because it stopped a couple of times and I had to clean out the, uh, the escape wheel. But other than that, it's a really cool watch. It is almost all original except for the crown. And I managed to get a decent watch from India <laughs> for once. So um, yeah, and it took a very short amount of time to get here. So those are, are pretty interesting watches. The crazywatches.pl guy has featured as those featured on his website. So you should get, definitely check him out. And that style of case is pretty common. I can show you that some examples from uh, Movado here. So these are, of course, there's, they're not focusing particularly well. These are Movado watches from their Zenith era. Hopefully it'll focus better. And so 
this one has the El Primero movement in it, and but this was their one of their dive watches, and they they kind of did this in both the dive and, and a pilot style. And then this here we have a um, this classic 70s rectangular watch, and its casing is is a similar thing. It's got catches on the four sides, and this whole back pulls out carrying the watch with it and the crown is a split crown i believe and then we have the widescreen version which is currently a project for me and so it's got this multi-piece case and so the, the the crystal has kind of a top hat shape to it so you know these crystals are probably impossible to find and we have a little gasket and so you know it's the gasket and then on top of the the dial and then you know the case goes down on it so it's very much a similar style and this also has four screws in in the corner that's really cool where you can see how they would um get in there you also see those on crotons um as well and is your zenith or um the movado is that called like the daytora or something what is that one called sorry about that so i'm going to mute myself i have to okay this one someone else can this is my um it's an it's an alsta it's similar to the one that uh, Richard Dreyfus wears in Jaws. In Jaws, yeah. It's got like a, it's got a very similar, it doesn't have the protected crown, but it has a very similar like crown, you know, to uh -huh. all the 70s dive watches and stuff. So this one I picked up for a few hundred bucks and I've always just kind of liked it as sort of like a token uh -huh. of the, the 70s Jaws kind of era. It's, it's 999 feet is what that one's rated to. Yeah, work. yeah. So 300 meters. Yeah. <laughs> If yeah, you weren't around, Sean, I don't know if you really appreciate what an impact that movie had on people. Literally, you know, for years, people would not go into the water at the beach after that movie came out. <laughs> it was, yeah, I mean, it was something you could not shake. It is, it is objectively like a really good movie now. Yeah. Like it's one of my, it's one of my favorites. My wife and I we watch it like every June or May. Oh really? Okay, okay. So you get right. it. All right. Over, we're like, all right, it's Jaws time. Let's let's put on Jaws. <laughs> Who else has something to show? Tim, Terry, Mike, Tim Moore. Anything from the seventies? Do you have any of those electromechanical clocks? You you look like you were nodding your head before. Well, I, I didn't think of uh, I didn't think of clocks, uh, frankly, but uh, yeah, this was, I think, the era of the ATO mechanical electromechanical clock, which in many respects, that was a thing that, as far as I can tell, the ATO just went everywhere, you know, it started out as a clock movement, but there are ATO movements in all kinds of electric watches uh, that were made. And I have, I, honestly, it's one of those things, I have yet to find one of those ATO-based watches that works as found. You know? <laughs> None of them are, are functioning when you get them. Or they function for a few minutes and then they stop or they function for a few days and then the wear out the battery completely you know so uh well it is kind of interesting <clears throat> right sean talked about his watch that was corroded and you relayed that but most of us have the experience that typically you know you find a 1870s pocket watch and you turn the key a few times and it'll go it'll start ticking right i mean it won't you know it won't always keep great time but you know more often than not you know it's just that someone stopped wearing it and put it in a drawer it wasn't because it was totally destroyed which which brings up my my uh, favorite story uh we had a watchmaker a clockmaker uh, a guy by the name of thurman witsit he was 90 some years old and he had never in his entire life done anything other than work on watches and clocks he worked for uh coleman in nashville and coleman was one of the founders of nawcc but he told this story about a lady who brought her husband's watch to him after he died and he cleaned it and everything got it all working and so on gave it back to her and she brought it back a week later and said it doesn't run and so he opened it up and looked inside he couldn't find a thing wrong with it so checked it out again gave it back to her and again about a week later she came back and said it wasn't running and 
he couldn't figure out for the longest time what it was. And finally, she said, he said, you know, he said, are, are you wearing it? Are you using it? Or, you know, and she said, no, she says, I just put it in the desk drawer. It's supposed to be self-winding, you know. So. <laughs> yeah, um, if I may interject here one last time, um, that project watch that Tim was showing me, well, <laughs> Tim Schultz was showing me, um, kind of reminded me of this little 17 jewel hell bros um, eventually it'll focus here I have the movement for it and the movement has 23 jewels to it it was in somebody's spare parts drawer and the guy just gave it to me because he wasn't using it for anything but um, I thought that was kind of the last example of a really cool 70s watch and I can pop out the very cool crystal from it right here <laughs> Uh, which is slightly damaged there's a bit of a crack to it and also it has a metal retainer ring that kind of sits in it um you know i have the resource i've had the resources to get a new movement for it i've just uh, either not had the money or i've not had the time <laughs> so eventually eventually i will have it running but um until then it sits on my desk and looks cool <laughs> Yeah, it was an interesting time for design just in general. And, you know, watches were uh, seemed to be a good sort of vehicle to uh, to try and play around with geometric design. But um, for for architecture as well. And and it is interesting, you know, Dan, like you were saying, like the that kind of tonneau shape or kind of like oblong or unbalanced case shape was like very popular at the time. And it's just like um, that was one of the reasons I got my my Octavia was that it just like not only is it cool because it's a nice big chronograph, but it's got a cool movement in it, which has its own kind of 60s, 70s kind of story to it. But then also just the shape of the case is so emblematic of, of that era of design. Yeah. Yeah. I guess they have the caliber 11 or caliber 12, depending on when you which one you have. Right. I mean, that yeah. one of the original, um, you know, the competing automatic chronographs from that late 60s era the yep. uh the most iconic uh of the heroes of course was the square one that uh, steve mcqueen wore in uh was that le mans or i forget the movie yeah le mans. <laughs> the same same movement you know Bolivar also used that movement as well they were part of that joint development project and i had two Bolivars of that with that movement uh one of the hewers with the calculator, the, the, the slide rule version. And mm -hmm. then I had a Zodiac and mm -hmm. I sold those things five, six years ago thinking, you know, I looked on eBay, the price isn't that great. I'm tired of these and I sold them. And now <laughs> I really regret selling them because they're, they're, they're worth a lot. And I've tried to buy some of the Bulbas back and, and they're going for twice of what I sold mine for. And it's like, well, I'll pass on that. Yeah, you, well, you never know. I'll you know. show you a, 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 again via remote camera a couple classics here. So of course the um, oh yeah the Omega Chrono Quartz. This thing came out for the Montreal Olympics, and they released that. And almost at the exact same time, Zenith uh, released this. Um, uh, they called it uh, the Time Commander. Um, or the future time command and you would push um, the button and it would display the seconds or uh, the calendar uh, day of the month um, down on this little lower LED window. They also had this one in a, a round version that was sometimes called a DeFi and the LED was above uh, six o'clock. Same movement, the movement was made uh, actually in Korea and got a project one here that I will show you. And it's a really complicated case. They don't, they, they didn't survive very well for a lot of design reasons. And that's a problem with this era of watch. So there's a module, yeah, they were focusing. So this was during the, um, they were owned by actually uh, Zenith Electronics Corporation of America at this time, but they really came out with some some not so great product design. So there's, there's a module and you can see a couple things of note. And one of them is that uh, you see two integrated circuits down 
on the lower side, you know, there and there, and they are encapsulated with some clear plastic. And you can see the little bond wires that go out to the circuit board traces along the side. And again, what contributed to the non-working of a lot of these watches is that there's inter you have to connect the module to the case. And in this particular situation, the case has got um, multiple pieces. There's an, an inner piece inside here that holds the movement and then connectivity has to happen between all of them. Another problem is that here on the battery contacts, they were just mechanically riveted. So you get a little bit of battery leakage in there and then it starts going into that joint and sure as hell, um, it stops making contact. And then another watch from a few years later is a Citizen watch that's a, a joint combination of analog and, and digital functionality hybrid kind of things. So those are kind of the, you know, some hybrids of the area yeah. with strange cases. And then, of course, you have your early Seikos from the mid-70s. And that's got a, a similar style case to these where there's underneath the lugs, you push in some releases and the whole back comes off or the cover comes off the top. And then there's a gasketing system that doesn't work particularly well on those. The Chrono Quartz is great. I've always loved mm -hmm. those watches. I think they're like... They're so, again, they're very emblematic of the era. And they've got the analog you know, clock next to the digital clock. And it's just like, you know, this giant sort of rounded rectangle. Mm -hmm. I always thought those were really cool. Yeah, I especially love the Omegas that would have a, um, they would have the analog face on top. They were over a reverso case. And you flip it over and they would have um, a digital display. Did you say you had one of those, Tim? I've got one of those. I'm trying to uh, trying to find it at this point, but uh, <laughs> it's a classic. I'm a little disoriented. Those came out in 1980, so I actually didn't uh, sort of in include it in, in there. So, yeah, I'm, you know, of course, that was also the, uh, the era of, of the last of the tuning fork watches. And... Um, you know, they thought that before the, the, the courts came on really big, they, they still uh, continued to believe that there might be a uh, future for tuning forks. And so Omega developed a, a tuning fork that didn't infringe on any of the Bulova patents. And it ran at um, 720 cycles rather than, than the 300 of the regular tuning fork. And they had this little crazy module that you see on this tuning fork is really an odd shape. And this little module is glued onto the tuning fork and it's got a free floating pod disc in there with four little ruby balls that is suspended between two um, sapphire plates. And then there's two little ruby tip uh, fingers on either side of this thing. And when it vibrates on the tuning fork, it actually imparts a rotary motion on that little disc. And that little disc actually has magnets in it and they couple through the air to two magnetic wheels that are under Underneath it, you know, even this screw here is actually made out of brass to not interfere with the magnetic coupling. So they call this uh, like the Megasonic or, you know, the, the 720 hertz. And they only made, I think, about 3,000 of these movements before they gave up on them. But, you know, that was classic crazy um, Swiss. And then if you get into crazy case designs, the um, Seamaster Lobster. You know, this is one that actually has one of those movements in it. Wow. <clears throat> and then here is the chronograph version. They call this the Speed Sonic. And uh, this one, the second hand has fallen off. But similar style case, um, similar bands. The band is pretty problematic. It's basically got strands of cable running through these links uh, to join them. And the cable stretches and then the bands start misbehaving and a lot of them get replaced. And then, of course, the Zodiac Astrographic, um, which I don't know if that was a 60s or a 70s design, but, you know, that was something yeah, that had very long cannon pinions and such connecting these discs um, that actually are the hands. So trying to get these discs off is a real challenge because they're kind of close together. And I don't know what they used in the factory, but I've created a little stand using razor blades. And 
usually what happens is that the plastic disc pops off the hub and then you pull the hub off and then try and reassemble it and hope that you didn't crack the disc in the process. Yeah, and I have a little um, Ernest Burrell cocktail time, which I'm probably gonna have to get going here pretty soon. So we'll show it off next week. But um, it's got, you know, a similar minute hand and then the minute hand has a, just a big round circle with a pattern print on it. And then yep. there's clear um clear just for the seconds space age right i guess that's kind of what probably kicked off the the, the optimism of the 70s was the moon landing in 69 and then the 70s was like this is the age of the future you know anything's possible so let's make our watches look ridiculous <laughs> okay you know the old old uh out with the old safe designs of the last hundred years so um i don't know if you've heard of the magazine europa star um, this is a swiss publication that has actually been published uh, since the 20s and as a member of the Horological Society of New York, they gave me a two-month kind of advanced subscription that gives you access to their past uh, episodes or issues. So, and mine runs out tomorrow, but I was looking through the 70s, and I'll bring up the, uh, try and bring up a 70s. So, it kind of uh, has lots of the pretty interesting advertisements you know for like uh the jenny watch case company um you know all kinds of brands that you've never heard of um some that you have heard of and <clears throat> you know, i have one of those jenny's it's not jenny case it's not a it's got a different brand on the dial those are Yeah, these those companies trying to make those thousand meter <clears throat> cases, they're always problematic. So as you know, you see some brands that you you know and others that you you haven't heard of. <clears throat> and you know, they also had a bunch, you know, some of the Italian brands, there's usually a, a section on on Italian and and French things as well. It seemed like they had a Bulova before. So do they do, do they have American ones in here as well? I guess at that point, it wouldn't really. Yeah, be they, they, they did have some. Um, let's, and then what's interesting is when you go to 79, so you get to 1979 and you know more some brands that you know of but then you start seeing you know the the courts um mm. Kinds, kinds of watches being advertised and you actually start seeing a Seiko and there's that citizen watch that I was mm -hmm. showing. So the Japanese, um, you know, are now starting to get featured. So it's kind of an interesting um, <clears throat> magazine and the, um, they offer different levels of subscriptions to it. The subscription level that offers access to these um, back issues is about 450 a year, I think. And then if you want one that allows you to copy this content, and as far as I can tell, it's not like you can copy a page. They, you can download it into this program called Press Reader that um, you can then gain access to it. I've been able to record video of me doing this with the episode, with these. I've tried doing um, screen capture mm -hmm. of these things mm -hmm. and it won't let you do a screen capture. Really? <laughs> so they've, you know, there's ways that, that. You, can, you can protect these things, so. You know, I just did a screen capture of it. <laughs> <laughs> you you got to view it on somebody else's computer. Yeah. yeah. 
So it's uh, one thing, this ad here, this bear group, one of my quartz watches, LED watches, has a, a bracelet that is branded bear, but uh, Hong Kong manufacturer. So, you know, at this point, a lot of these people were um, going offshore to, to support it or, you know, to, to lower costs. But, you know, here is, you know, the latest issues of uh, <clears throat> Europa Star. And um, I think now they are, you know, just to see what a current uh, episode looks like. So obviously has uh, <clears throat> things that are more relevant. Um, So, and uh, speaking of uh, world time, uh, there's, um, you know, bipartisan support uh, from a limited number of people to uh, try and uh, go into permanent daylight savings time. I'm thinking I'm probably going to have to go eat lunch here, guys. Yeah, it's been going on for two and a half hours at this point from when I first logged on. So I'll go ahead and call it a day if you're all good with that. So Mike, good to see you there off in the corner by yourself. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate this. You uh, had any luck getting your um, Waltham eight day uh, twin barrel clocks um, running? You remember? No, I haven't. I haven't uh, put any time into it either. But... We'll have to do a session on those one of these days. So they're great clocks. Cool. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, sign off at this point. Um, stop it all. Thank you for joining. Uh, hopefully I didn't ramble too long. No, that was great. Yeah. Thank you guys. And <clears throat> thanks for letting me share my, uh, my stuff. That was fun. All right. Well, thank you for suggesting. And uh, we'll plan something for next month. I'll figure it out and let you all know. Talk to you later. Bye. 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 Bye.